I would like to welcome everybody to this Sunday service, Sunday, January 8th. Thank you for being a part of the church family. Thank you for visiting if you're visiting and, and just being in person or online or up in Golden too. I see that there's folks gathering at St. Andrew's Church in Golden. Thank you for your faithful financial support. Indeed, everybody, I actually am quite amazed how we keep church working. It's not like we have a big congregation here in Windermere Valley or in Golden. So obviously, uh, people are generous and, and make it happen. So thank you so much. Our upcoming Sunday service leadership, I'm leading the next two Sundays, and then Tess is leading the last Sunday of January. So a little attention to the Mission and Service Fund and the PWRDF, which is the Anglican Fund. A little focus today on the PWRDF continues to support existing and new partners working in Ukraine. Here's an update on one new project. In April 2022, so last April, a few months ago, PWRDF began a partnership with Fight, or Fight for Right, an organization led by Ukrainian women with disabilities that provides care and advocacy for disabled people in Ukraine. Due to constant shelling of gas pipelines and the inability to repair them, people in most cities in the Donetsk region live without gas. It also means there is no water because the sewer system cannot function without heat. The water in the pipes will freeze. Right, Fight for Right anticipated the very cold winter back in June and initiated the TEPLO project when they started receiving requests for help from people with disabilities to survive the upcoming winter. TEPLO will provide targeted support to 5,000 people with disabilities during this winter time who experience difficulties with warming the house or having or have shortage of clean water. PWRDF, the Primates World Relief Development Fund, is providing just under $100,000 towards the TEPLO project. Funds will allow for the purchase of warming items such as portable gas stoves, thermal pajamas, sleeping bags, electric heated blankets, powered charging blankets, and portable gas heaters. If possible, diesel power generators will be purchased for houses that are without gas and electricity. This is just one way our gifts to PWRDF help others in the world. And you can donate at pwrdf.org. And of course, they always make it very easy to donate. Every Friday morning, we have what's called Fridays with Eckert. Uh, it starts at 10 a.m. and it's online, a time of listening to talks by Eckert and discussion. It's a time to gain spiritual insight and self-awareness. Uh, please let me know if you'd like to receive a link. So next Saturday, there's something that happens every second Saturday Marcus Borg, who I'm going to be further quoting today, passed away in 2015, but his wife, Marianne, uh, keeps this uh, very interesting um, education discussion format going. There's about oh, close to 400 people that join on Saturday mornings. This coming Saturday, so Saturday, January 14th, she's going to have a discussion with Barbara Brown Taylor. And you have to it, there's no cost to get the Zoom link. It's just that you have to sign up for it. So you have to go to marcusjborg.org website to sign up and get the free Zoom link. And um, uh, and so Barbara Brown Taylor is just a wonderful um, person. And she actually gave the message at Marcus's funeral service when he passed away. And Sally and I very much look forward to this coming Saturday to this interview with Barbara Brown Taylor. I just wanted to highlight the quote here underneath Marcus's picture. Experience of God, not belief in God, is the invitation of Christianity. Okay. <clears throat> Oops. Now, um, we're going to do a spring book study on the gift of years. I'm just going to do this again. Uh, by Joan Chittister. So the title is The Gift of Years, and the subtitle is Growing Older Gracefully. I'm a little nervous about doing a study on this because I don't know if there's many people in the congregation that can relate to aging and growing older. 
But just in case there are, but maybe some of you want to read it for somebody you know, you know, somebody else. Um, we'll do it over seven Wednesdays, so seven weeks long. Uh, it's a very readable book. Joan Chittister is a, a lovely author, and it's a lovely book that looks at aging issues from many different angles. Uh, so it'll be on Wednesday, starting February 15th, so just a couple of weeks before Lent, because Ash Wednesday is, I think, the week after. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of a Lenten study that, that we'll do on Wednesdays. Uh, let me know if you'd like me to order you a book. They'll be about $25. Okay. So we're going to um, continue reading. We're reading through the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So today's two calls that we're reading are under the category justice. So call number 25, we call upon the federal government to establish a written policy that reaffirms the independence of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to investigate crime in which the government has its own interest as a potential or real party in civil litigation. And call number 26, we call upon the federal, provincial and territorial governments to review and amend their respective statutes of limitations to ensure that they conform to the principle that governments and other entities cannot rely on limitation defenses to defend legal actions of historical abuse brought by Aboriginal people. Good. As we begin our service, may I say, the Lord be with you. We acknowledge that we are on traditional lands that have been occupied by Indigenous people for thousands of years. And I like to, that really speaks to me when I think thousands of years. Um, the land that we are now on was, was occupied by Indigenous people. And we celebrate that we are now in a time where we are trying to live in a more intentional and thoughtful relationship with one another. And that's a very good thing. And now we'll have a, it's called a call to presence, which is a simple but fundamental spiritual practice uh, to be able to just not think for a moment, but still be aware just to know the difference between being in a moment with awareness rather than in a moment thinking about something. <laughs> so let's just have a moment of presence. just to look at the theme of our service today. Today is the baptism of Jesus Sunday, which always follows Christmas. But our primary focus today will be um, like an introduction to the Bible. I'm going to do a three Sunday, three week sort of introduction to the Bible in my messages. So that's the focus today. Today is also the first Sunday after Epiphany, um, which, which was on Friday. Epiphany is January 6th. Epiphany is a Greek word for manifestation or appearance. It was and is a celebration of Jesus being shown to the world, to the world, to Jews and to non-Jews, uh, which, you know, Jewish in tradition calls Gentiles, which is the particular message of the Gentile wise men coming to see the Christ child in Jesus. That Jesus um, wasn't just for the Jewish people, but was for non-Jewish people as well. The world, word epiphany has been generalized also to refer to seeing a revelation that we haven't seen before. So people, even in common society, will, will say, I had an epiphany. Light is a common symbol of epiphany. The light dawns on people, that is a revelation. 
and seeing the divine and sacred in the ordinariness of the world. All our hymns today are epiphany hymns, and uh, you'll note the image of light in each of our hymns today. So our first hymn today is Arise, Your Light Has Come, Is Come, and you can stay seated, you can stand if you're in person, and uh, it's hymn number 79 in Voices United. Let's uh, enjoy singing Arise, Your Light Is Come. Well, thanks everybody. You can have a seat. Uh, this is an epiphany prayer that's in Voices United, but it's on our screen as well. And um, let's just read it together. Radiant God, light for all people and all places. By the guidance of a star, you led the Magi to worship the Christ child. By the light of faith, lead us to worship you in peace and love and guide us in your way. We pray in the name of Christ, light of the world, amen. So yes, our focus today is on the Bible and I'd like uh, the words of wisdom today, I'd like to read from Karen Armstrong's book, The Lost Art of Scripture. I hope to speak on this in a couple of weeks, but there's just so much right in that title, The Lost Art of Scripture. Augustine came to realize that scripture was accessible only to those who shared the humility of Christ, the word of God, who had stooped to our level. In scripture, the timeless word had been revealed in words written by fallible mortal men. Yeah, anyways, the exclusive word men, but it, probably many women didn't get to write much that went into the Bible. Scripture, therefore, could never yield absolute truth, and its meaning will only become clear at the end of time. The language of Scripture is conditioned by the inadequacy of human nature. Both are limited. So quarreling about the interpretation of the Bible was foolish, Augustine thought, and destructive, since the purpose of Scripture was to create a bond between Christians. Augustine had no time for people who believed that they alone understood the meaning of Scripture. Their pride and egotism had isolated them from the community. Rather, the diversity of possible interpretations should unite Christians, whose views may otherwise differ, together in love. No theologian, Karen Armstrong writes, apart from Paul, has been more influential in the Western world than Augustine. Even though he focused on the literal and historical sense of scripture, Augustine was no diehard literalist. His principle of accommodation would dominate biblical interpretation in the West well into the early modern period. He explained that God had adapted his revelation to the cultural norms of the people who first received it. One of the Psalms, for example, reflects the ancient view, long outmoded by Augustine's time, that there was a body of water above the earth that caused rainfall. It would, Augustine insisted, be ridiculous to interpret this verse literally. God had simply accommodated his revelation to the science of the day so that the people of Israel 
could understand it. If the literal meaning of scripture clashed with reliable scientific information, Augustine ruled the interpreter must respect the integrity of science or he would bring scripture into disrepute. A great deal of trouble could have been avoided if later Christians had taken this advice seriously. End of our words of wisdom today. And uh, so for some of you who don't know, this is Benny the Bear. And I'm going to go see if Benny is showing up for church today. is the mic oh, there. it's always a hard start on this mic yeah oh. um i'm glad you kind of got it fuzzy out, today yeah. what's that about huh um what's that benny oh it's about fuzzy oh yeah oh ah. oh you mean the hi hello and it's always hard to get my legs out yeah and let me help you benny good to see you yeah, where were you last week? I was waiting for you, and <clears throat> things yeah. went funny, didn't they? Yeah, Benny, they did. Um, I was so excited. There was a kid here in church, and I was going to say hi to them, and then yeah. I don't like the internet sometimes. I know. I have two expert technicians. Oh, and yeah. I rely on them heavily, but they they figured it out last week, but it just took a little while. I see. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Benny, I... Um, I want to. Uh, what do you got there? I've got two things in my hand. Yeah. I've got a Bible in one hand. Uh huh. And I have um, Sally. Um, oh, yeah, I know her. Sally. She helps me back here. Yep. Um, her mom wrote her memoirs. Oh, smart idea. It is actually a very yeah. smart idea. And her mom's name is Rose. Yeah. And so her memoirs are entitled The Life of a Rose. Oh, that's a neat title. And, and I just wanted to um, say that. I think there's a similarity between the Bible and uh, yeah. someone who writes down family stories uh -huh. so that it kind of stays in the family um, about what happened in the past. Neat. And um, <clears throat> so the Bible is a collection of literature that goes, oh. yeah, it's been written over a long, long period of time. Yeah, but, God sat down and wrote it, right? No. God did not write the Bible. And that's something we're oh. going to talk about. You know, it's interesting. There are people who think that God wrote the Bible, but it's not that simple. And it's helpful no. that, to know it's not that simple. Yeah, I know that. And uh, But it, it's like having a... But Rose sat down and wrote that book. Well, and that's the difference because when one person sits down to write something, it often is easier to read and more... You yeah. Know, yeah. But yeah, and it follows a theme. Or yeah. But it's sort of like it's still the Bible's kind of a collection of family stories. Yeah. That tells us where we've come from and people love our past and how we're connected. Like it, it kind of the idea was to hold people together and having a memoir in a family like Sally's Yeah, she's family. lucky to have that. Do you have one too? You know, I do. My, yeah. My dad wrote his memoir. Oh, you're so lucky too. But my mom didn't. That's too bad. She should have. I know she should have. It would have been me. So it leads to something else, oh, Benny. No one in my family. Is that what you're going to ask? I don't have one in my family. Well, yeah. Because we don't have opposable thumbs and we can't write. <laughs> and, and, but do you know what we have? What I you? have stories too, right? just not written down. But like, it's like, hey, see that tree over there? It used to be just as tall as this. And when I was a boy, I used to climb that tree. And one time this person came by and I watched them go by. And like my yeah. parents told me stories and my siblings. And then I've heard about my great, great, great grand bear <laughs> and what they did and how they caught this fish, this salmon that was like four feet long. There's so many okay. stories. Yeah. Am so, I going on too long? Yeah, a little bit, Benny. Sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's good, Benny. But 
You know, there's we have a word for what you're talking about, Benny. Um, and you, talking too much? No, 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 no. Oh. That's fine. But it's the word is oral, oral stories, or oral tradition. And so for bears, um, they must pass their stories on orally because you can't, you don't have yeah. opposing thoughts, yeah. so you can't write them down. Right. And with my mother, um, um, I know stories about my mother, and my sister knows stories, and my brother knows stories. Um, but they're just oral stories because uh, we, we haven't written them down yet. Or she didn't write them down. Right. We haven't written them down. And so every family has stories, whether they're written or oral. Neat. And it's not just like big families, like societies have oral stories, yeah, right? That's true, too. Yeah. yeah that's true too. Um, and it, it is good to write them down, but it's also just good to recognize that we have oral stories. And a lot, well, there's... You know, do you think they change over time, those oral stories, maybe sometimes? Oh, they do, for sure, for sure. Because I don't think my great, 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 great grand bear caught that six foot long salmon. Oh, I think it's it. too big. And, you know, it, it could well be that there's a lot of stories in the Bible that were told orally, like around campfires and so on, yeah. for hundreds of years Yeah. before they actually started to get written down. And... um. And they would have changed and shifted. And then the people who wrote them down would have changed and shifted them and so on like that. But it's like, yeah, for sure, the Bible, you know, was, you know, the, a lot of the stories were oral yeah. um, before they started getting written down. And like the Me. stories about Jesus, they all existed orally before they started getting written down. That's great. You should talk yeah. about this in the sermon today. Uh, no. I got other things to talk about. Oh. But I'm glad you and I got to talk about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm always glad to talk to you. I thank you. And I I'm I, glad with the internet works too. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I sure enjoy talking to you, Benny. Thank you for okay. coming to church today. Yeah. Yeah. See you later. Right. Uh, Bye. Wonderful. I hope you folks online can hear okay. We're going to go back to our PowerPoint. Good. And we have our second epiphany hymn. Um, such a beautiful one. A Light is Gleaming, written by Linnea Good. It's number 82 in Voices United. Let's enjoy singing A Light is Gleaming. Yeah. 
Beautiful, everybody. Thank you, Greg, and for playing that, Carolyn, for singing. Beautiful hymn. Oh, time for scripture. So Judy is here in person in Invermere and is going to read our, our scripture today. Hi, Judy. Whoop. Unmute myself. No. Oh. Okay. The first reading is from Isaiah 42. Karen Armstrong writes in the Lost Art of Scripture, in 530 BCE, Cyrus the 11th, King of Persia, conquered the Babylonian Empire and issued an edict that permitted the deported peoples to return to their homeland and rebuild their national shrines. A prophet known as Second Isaiah hailed Cyrus as a Messiah, a man specially anointed by Yahweh to end Israel's long exile. He drew his fellow exiles' attention to the servant, a figure apparently known to the Jewish people in exile, who seemed to embody the pain of the exiled community. In the following verses, Second Isaiah may be referring to King Cyrus, and what he represented to the Jewish people. From Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. In the Gospel reading from Matthew 3, Jesus comes to John to be baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness in this context means doing the work that God has given one to do. God's pleasure in Jesus is announced as Jesus' ministry begins. Obedience to the call of God is a continuing theme in Matthew. 
The blessings of God, however, are not contingent on behavior. Rather, such grace is what makes it possible to follow in God's ways. What might be ways we can recall our beloved natures? If it is your tradition to stand for the gospel reading, please feel free to stand. From Matthew 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. May we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, Judy. And our next uh, epiphany hymn is In the Darkness Shines the Splendor. It's number 92 in Voices United. Thank you, everybody. Please have a seat. And now we move to the message time. Today, I have um, prepared a PowerPoint presentation to talk about the Bible. And so I hope you can see the screen and hear me okay. So I'm just going to get it working there. Okay, here we go. I'd like to do a little introduction to the Bible in the, in the, in the next three weeks. I once offered a study called Bible Study for Dummies in a church and was surprised by who came from the congregation. Some older women who normally didn't come to studies shyly came. They had been active in church their whole lives, but found the Bible bewildering, bewildering and intimidating. It's like they felt shame in not knowing the Bible better. In truth, this is understandable because the Bible is bewildering and intimidating. It is a big ask trying to know the Bible better. So don't feel bad if you feel you don't know the Bible very well. <clears throat> the Bible. The word Bible means the book. 
but it is not one book. It is a library of books. That's so important, just that in itself. It's a library of books written over a thousand year period. A thousand years is a long time by hundreds of different writers, editors, for many different reasons in their worldviews, addressing issues that mattered to them then. The material in the Old Testament, I'm not sure how to get rid of that on the top of my screen, but we'll deal with it. Oh, there it goes. The material in the Old Testament was written before Jesus. The material in the New Testament was written after Jesus. For Protestants, there are 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. For Roman Catholics, there are 73 books, 46 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. For Orthodox churches, there are 80 books, 53 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. Note that for Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox, um, they always have 27 books in the New Testament. So I just find this imagery of a library helpful. You can see, in this case, the Protestant version of 26 books. So there's the law books, the history books, the poetry books, the major prophets, the minor prophets. And then in the New Testament, there's the Gospels, church history, which is the book of Acts, letters, 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 and then the last book, prophecy, the book of Revelation. But that imagery of a library of books is helpful. We can call the Old Testament the Old Testament, and we can also call it the Hebrew Bible. Jewish folks are okay with both. They don't mind the term Old Testament because anything old like that is valued. And so it sort of says that their Bible, the Jewish Bible, is valued. It's old. Um, the Jewish Bible has basically the same literature as what we have and what we call the Old Testament, but they put them in 24 books. Uh, they just divide it up differently. So 24 books where we have 39 in the Old Testament, and they are in different order uh, in the Jewish Bible than they appear in the Old Testament. Jewish people also use the acronym Tanakh for the, their Bible. The acronym Tanakh comes from the first letters of each of the following Hebrew words for the three general areas of the Hebrew Bible. Torah, the law, Navim, the prophets, and Kethuvim, the writings. They make the acronym Tanakh. So you can see T-N-K, the Tanakh. So there you go. Just for clarity as well, we used to use the terms BC and AD. We don't so much any longer. Now we use BCE and CE. As explained online, the Gregorian calendar is the global standard for the measurement of dates. Despite originating in the Western Christian tradition, its use has spread throughout the world and now transcends religious, cultural, and linguistic boundaries. As most people are aware, the Gregorian calendar is based on the supposed birth date of Jesus Christ. The idea to count years from the birth of Jesus Christ was first proposed in the year 525 by Dionysus Exegus, a Christian monk. Standardized under the Julian and Gregorian calendars, the system spread throughout Europe and the Christian world during the centuries that followed. AD stands for Anno Domini, Latin for in the year of the Lord, while BC stands for before Christ. An important reason for adopting BCE, CE is religious neutrality. Since the Gregorian calendar has superseded other calendars to become the international standard, members of non-Christian groups may object to the explicitly Christian origins of BC and AD, Particularly problematic is A.D. in the year of the Lord, and it's an unavoidable implication that the Lord in question is Jesus Christ. So to be more respectful to other people outside the Christian religion and all people, people now use the notations B.C.E. before Common Era and C.E. Common Era. The process of being canonized was very slow. The word canon comes from the Greek word canon, which means measuring stick or rule. The Old Testament canon wasn't set until 100 years or so after Jesus. That's an important line. The New Testament canon wasn't set until around 367 after the birth of Jesus or in the Common Era. Even the word set or canon is misleading because there never was a church conference or bishop's decree 
that said, these are the official books of the Bible. It's just what evolved in common practice. There are many works of literature that didn't make it in the canon of the Bible. There are some works that made it into the canon that some people think shouldn't be there. So for example, there are other gospels about Jesus, about 16, other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Peter. All these other writings that didn't make it into the Bible are called apocrypha, which means things put away or things hidden. So the image on this uh, slide here is uh, says the Gospel of Mary. It's a book by Philip Freeman on the Gospel of Mary. When we look at the Bible, I, Brent, think there are two general questions to consider. First, how do we see the Bible? Because how we see the Bible matters. And then, of course, what is in the Bible? What are the contents of the Bible? It's very hard to know all of the little details in the Bible. And maybe sometime, I thought maybe I'd do it in the next three weeks, but I think I'm going to run out of time. We'll do a, a general, an, an overview of the general themes in the Bible. That might happen. It may not. Someday it will. As you know, many people don't give the Bible much consideration. For them, the Bible doesn't have much to offer, and they may even have a negative view of the Bible. It could be said that there is much ignorance about the Bible, meaning both having little idea as well as not wanting to know more. Then there are other people who have an elevated view of the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is holy. Whatever it says must be taken literally and authoritatively. It is inspired, God inspired the people who wrote it, they think. Even if people have an elevated view of the Bible, it doesn't mean that they know it well. John Shelby Spong tells the story of speaking in a Bible-based church where people brought their Bibles to Sunday services. There were about 160 people in church that Sunday. He asked the whole congregation to work together to come up with the Ten Commandments without looking at their Bible. All 160 people working together could not remember the Ten Commandments. Some questions to consider are, what is a realistic view of the Bible? Can we take the Bible seriously without taking the Bible literally? If we think critically of the Bible, does this mean we are attacking faith? Or does this mean we are acting faithfully? Can some parts of the Bible be inspired while other parts are not inspired? People can be resistant or defensive when challenged in their view of the Bible. Can we be aware of defensiveness and resistance in ourselves and others? In an article in the January 2023, so just this month edition of Sojourners, a Christian justice, social justice magazine, on how the National Rifle Association in the United States deliberately sought the adherence of Christians, a representative of the NRA said, the NRA needed access to church communities, and there's one reason. Because when you make something a matter of faith, not only do people stop questioning it, but they're actually forbidden from questioning it. This seems to be an unhealthy outcome for some faith-based people. So the question is, can people of faith be also good at questioning so there is biblical illiteracy for sure, not only in society, but also in churches. By people who have been church going or who have been studying the Bible their whole lives. But again, there is a reason many people don't know the Bible well. In honesty, I, Brent, would say that the Bible is hard to read. It is dense. It is long. Most of it is boring. It lacks a consistent theme. It often talks about things that don't really matter to us today. It is repetitive. It is overall often not well written. It is not like a novel that is written by one author who develops characters and a theme that moves from one scene to another sequentially. So the Bible makes it hard for people to read the Bible. I would say it gets in its own way. Having said that, the Bible can be a treasure chest of stories and parables and wisdom sayings that invite reflection and which point to something more. While we need to be and can be critically thinking people in reading the Bible, we can also appreciate how many texts invite deeper reflection if we let them. 
Still, this doesn't mean that the Bible isn't difficult reading. When I, Brent, had the opportunity to read our adult children's theses from university, I not only couldn't do it, after a few pages, I didn't want to do it. Our son wrote his doctoral thesis on a particular matter to do with chemistry. Our daughter wrote her master's thesis on something to do with mechanical engineering. They used a lot of language I didn't understand and generally talked about things that didn't make sense to me. Should I feel bad that I didn't get it and wanted to read something more interesting? I have not read their thesis. <laughs> I tried. Um, the question I ask is, is reading the Bible a similar experience for many people? Addressing misconceptions about the Bible. It is not one book. Again, it's a library of books. It is not written by one author. It does not speak with one voice. There is not one unified message. Many messages contradict each other. It does not have all the answers to all the questions. It is not easy to read or understand. It was not written for us today. It was written to address some issues for some people in their time. Some words in the Bible may point to timeless truths. That doesn't mean all do. The writers did not intend to be historically or biologically factual. They, they both couldn't be, and they had other interests for writing. I would not tell someone who was, say, struggling with depression to just read the Bible, for it will make you feel better. I would not say that, because it will not. If they start reading at the beginning of Genesis, by the time they get to Genesis chapter 3 or 4, their eyes will be glazing over, and they will be wondering if they're just inadequate while other people get this stuff. A term I use for the Bible is, it is pearls in the pile. There are many pearls in the Bible, but they are hidden amid a pile of literature that is less important. Finding the pearls is akin to finding needles in a haystack. We need to know, and many people do know, where the pearls are, and maybe we need help finding the pearls. A man named A.J. Jacobs wrote a book called the, the Year of Living Biblically. He tried to live according to the Bible for one year. It's a good read if you're ever interested in reading it. During this year, he read the Bible thoroughly. Uh, he, he read many commentaries on the Bible and interviewed many Jewish and Christian people about their view on the Bible. He says at the end of the book, so here's a spoiler alert, uh, paraphrasing, everyone cherry picks the Bible, everyone, and has their favorite passages. From the most, most orthodox to the most biblically based person, everyone focuses in on particular passages and ignores others. It could not be otherwise. So when Jehovah Witnesses come to your door, know that they cherry pick too. They focus in on certain passages and ignore others. Everybody does. Many of us wish that the Bible had easy to read and understand passages that were sweet and comforting, and they wish that these sweet passages could be the ones and only ones that were read on Sunday from which the preacher would preach. So do I. I wish that. In other words, we wish that there were more hallmark verses in the Bible. There are some, but they may not be as prevalent as people think. There are a lot of verses in the Bible where people may think, oh, I like that. Ooh, but I don't like this. So some thoughts from Marcus Borg in his book, Reading the Bible Again for the First Time. Conflict about the Bible is the single most divisive issue among Christians in North America today. The conflict is between two very different ways of reading the Bible. First, a literal factual way, and second, a, a historical metaphorical way. All of us, whether we use reading glasses or not, read through lenses. Some people read the Bible through the literal factual lens. Some people read the Bible through the historical metaphorical lens. Those who read through the literal factual lens see the Bible as the in inerrant and in as an errant and infallible. The Bible is a, a divine product. God inspired the people who wrote it, so it is the word of God. These people often criticize moderate to liberal Christians for watering the Bible down and avoiding its authority. Those who read through the historical, metaphorical lens 
are less clear about how they should see the Bible than about how they do not. They are strongly convinced that many parts of the Bible cannot be taken literally, either as historically factual or as expressing the will of God. So the literal factual way of reading the Bible does not work for many people. Is there another way? Yes, the historical metaphorical way. By historical, meta, by historical approach, I, Marcus Borg, mean all the methods that are relevant to discerning the ancient historical meanings of the biblical text. The chief concern of the historical approach is the past tense question. What did this text mean in the ancient historical setting in which it was written? Setting biblical passages in their ancient context makes them come alive. By metaphorical approach, I, Marcus Borg says, he means most broadly a non-literal way of reading biblical text. A metaphorical reading does not confine itself to the literal, factual, and historical meaning of the text. It moves beyond to the question, what does this story mean as a story independent of its historical factuality? The metaphorical approach enables us to see and affirm meanings that go beyond the particularity of what the text meant in the ancient setting. Stories that combine fact as well as metaphor. So there are stories in the Bible that, that seem to combine fact as well as metaphor. There can be or are stories that combine both history and metaphor. It results in what we might call history metaphorized. A historical event lies behind the story, but metaphor is added to give it meaning. For example, in today's gospel reading of the baptism of Jesus by John, it could be that factually Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And it could be that metaphor was added by the gospel writers. Let's consider these words. As he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. As metaphor, what might this mean? Jewish readers, hearing these stories, would think of the story of how Moses parted the water and a new way was opened up to the land of freedom. Or they might think of the story of Noah and how the dove came at the end of the 40 days of rain as a sign that dry land was available, the passage was over, and a new beginning was at hand. People familiar with the Old Testament would make connections between Jesus and the messages in those older stories. And there potentially are just metaphorical stories. Marcus Borg says, there can also be purely metaphorical narratives. These are stories that have no particular historical event lying behind them. Examples in this category in the Old Testament include the creation stories in the book of Genesis, or the story of Jonah and the big fish, and the story of the sun standing still in the sky in time, in the time of Joshua, so he could kill more Amalekites, Israel's enemies. It, New Testament stories in this category may include much of the birth stories of Jesus or stories of him walking on water, multiplying loaves and fish, changing water into wine, and so forth. When we see the Bible through the historical metaphorical lens, we may then see the Bible, that the Bible is not the product of God as much as it is a human product. It is the product of two ancient communities, the ancient Jewish community and the ancient Christian community. That is why now during a Sunday service, we may not say after the reading of scripture, this is the word of the Lord. Instead, we may say something like, may we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. For those who see the Bible through the historical metaphorical lens, the Bible is still sacred, but not because of its divine origins. It is sacred in that it may be a sacrament, a vehicle through which grace insight, and deeper truths come through. For many, seeing the Bible through the historical metaphorical lens has allowed them to take the Bible seriously, even as they don't take it literally. So we've looked today at the important question of how we see the Bible. It's an important question because how we see the Bible affects how we interpret it and make sense of it. 
Many people think the Bible is not credible because they think that they have to take it literally factually or not take it at all. It may be helpful for them to know that there is another lens through which they can see the Bible. Next week, we'll be looking at the four source theory of who wrote the first five books of the Bible, J, E, D, and P. The week after, we'll look at Karen Armstrong's book, The Lost Art of Scripture. A reminder, if you would like to review this slide presentation, you can access the recorded service for today by going to our website, type in wvsm.ca, and once they are clicking where it says recorded services can be accessed by this link. If anyone would like to talk to me about what has been shared today, please talk to me, please, please let me know. As will hopefully be said in upcoming weeks, conversation and dialogue was the point of scripture not having set ideas that were beyond discussion. The end of the message. Time to sing our next epiphany hymn, Will You Come and See the Light? And it's number 96 in Voices United. see the light from the stable door it is shining newly bright though it shone before it will be your guiding star it will show you who you are will you hide or decide to meet the light will you step into the light that can free the slave it will stand for what is right, it will heal and save. By the pyramids of greed, there's a longing to be free. Will you hide or decide to meet the light? Will you tell the light the light in the prison cell? Though it's shackled out of sight, it is shining well. When the truth is cut and bruised, and the innocent are used, will you hide or decide to meet the light? Will you join the hope alight in the young girl's eyes of the mighty put to flight by a baby? Cries. When the lowest and the least are the foremost at the feast, will you hide or decide to meet the light? Will you travel by the light of the babe newborn? In the candle lit at night, there's a gleam of dawn, and the darkness all about is too dim to put it out will you hide or decide to meet the light wonderful everybody please have a seat if you're standing karen it's super nice to see you again we missed you all fall because you were in saskatchewan i think kind of on the edge of the world where there was no electricity or something and so now you've moved and you're you're somewhere where you're hooked up to the internet. So nice to have you back and leading our prayer time today. Thank you. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and loving God, we come today to thankful and praising your name. We pray for justice on earth for each nation and each person. Lord, may you grant the world an end to all wars persecution and mistreatments. Foster in us all people of compassion and acceptance. May we all be willing and able to do the work that you need us to do. Ever present God, take our lives and use our talents to bring life and hope to the world and all its people. As we have entered a new year, May we all have new beginnings with the troubles and trials of the past put firmly behind us and with grace and humility face this new year. 
Bless all our families, friends, and neighbors with their needs met, whatever they may be. We ask a special blessing on our church family. Grant healing and comfort for all who are ill or suffering in any way. Today we pray for Pat and Andrea Prefontaine, Jacob Best and Sam Best, and all whom we name now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Edna Green. Bless all who have mourning the loss of their loved ones. May they feel your healing touch. We, may we venture forth confident in your love and care, rejoicing in Jesus, the act of the rite of baptism. We are grateful for the words that he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Karen, or Karen, you're, um, you're a prayerful person and you do a beautiful job of putting prayerful words together. So thank you. And our last hymn then today is I Am the Light of the World. Uh, I often think of this as the hymn to end Christmas, the season of Christmas with. Um, and as you pay attention to the words, you'll know why. And so let's sing I Am the Light of the World, number 87 and Voices United. And I just also want to add that this is on the refrain. Normally, uh, Wendy will play tambourine, but since she's not here, um, I would invite you to clap. Um, All right. I am the light of the world, da-da-da, and then da-da-da. Oh, okay. We don't want Greg clapping, so please clap. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, things are going to go awry. <laughs> okay, we'll get back on track. <laughs> <clears throat> I am the light of the world You people come and follow me If you follow and love You'll learn the mystery Of what you were meant to do and be When the song of the angels is when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the shepherds have found their way home, the work of Christmas is begun. I am the light of the world. You people come and follow me. If you follow and love, you'll learn the mystery of what you were meant to do and be. To find the lost and lonely one, to heal the broken soul with love, to feed the hungry children with warmth and good food, to feel the earth below the sky above. I am the light of the world. You people come and follow me. If you follow and love, you'll learn the mystery of what you were meant to do and be. To free the prisoner from all chains, to make the powerful care, to rebuild the nations with strength of goodwill, to see God's children everywhere. Follow and love, you'll learn the mystery of what you were meant to do and be. To bring hope to every time.
ask you to to dance at a baby's new birth to make music in an old person's heart and sing to the colors of the earth I am the light of the world you people come and follow me if you follow It's hard, hard to not smile singing that <laughs> hymn. Um, this a closing, um, it's a prayer, this Invoice is United, an epiphany prayer. I thought we would read it together as our kind of closing benediction today because it's just beautiful and prayerful. So let's read together. God of gold, we seek your glory, the richness that transforms drabness into color, and brightens our dullness with vibrant light, your wonder and joy at the heart of all life. God of incense, we offer you our prayer, our spoken and unspeakable longings, our questioning of truth, our searching for your mystery deep within. God of myrrh, we cry out to you in our suffering the pain of all our rejections and bereavements, our baffled despair at undeserved suffering, our rage at continuing injustice. In our wealth, in our yearning, in our anger and loss, we embrace you, God, with us. Amen. <laughs>